Welcome to Beyond the Balance Sheet, the podcast that helps advisors, clinical professionals, and affluent families understand the complexities of issues related to our mental, physical, and emotional well-being. Our co-hosts, Arden O'Connor and Diana Clark, will interview a series of guests on a range of topics, providing informative content and practical tools for professionals and families to consider. Here are your hosts, Arden and Diana. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Beyond the Balance Sheet podcast. I am joined today by Mike Richter, who we are really excited to have on this episode. Welcome, Mike. Hey, thank you for having me. Well, today's topic is an interesting one. It's Mike Richter's journey, life beyond the ice. And I'm going to give our listeners and our viewers a little bit of background. Um, I'm sure many of them know who you are, but I thought it would just give some context to the conversation, which I know is going to be interesting. So Mike Richter serves as the president of Bright Core Energy, and he's a leader in the area of sustainability. Following a 15-year career with the New York Rangers, he was a three-time NHL All-Star and Stanley Cup champion and Olympic medalist. Mike Richter went on to receive his degrees in ethics, politics, and economics with a concentration in environmental politics from Yale University. He's now a key spokesperson for environmental issues and regulations, such as resource efficiency and climate change. Mike, it's a fascinating career that you have. Can you tell me a little bit about the transition from professional athlete into the green energy space? Well, sure. And first of all, thanks for having me. This is a great program. So uh, hopefully it will continue to be so today. Um, it, it does seem on the surface different path, but um, really it, it shouldn't be. Um, what do you do as an athlete? You, you try to reach your potential. You are pushing yourself to be as um, competitive in every manner as possible. Um, and leaving that world, uh, there's a huge gap in your, in your interaction with day-to-day -day life. I miss that intensity and that, that pressure in, in a sense and the challenge of getting up every day and not knowing whether you're going to be able to perform and doing everything you can to hopefully, you know, have the answer come in the affirmative. But under the best of circumstances, you're going to have a short career um, and it's wonderful on a personal level. The challenge is amazing. Um, the teamwork, the camaraderie, I learned a ton. But it doesn't mean you're necessarily prepared for anything else in life. And that's why I went back to school. And there's a lot of needs out there in the world and, and opportunities. And now I'm looking in the built environment and trying to have buildings reach their potential. It's, it's, it just doesn't feel like it's a big stretch for me. I know it sounds different on paper. Um, and I think the connecting tissue is health health and performance are bound together, whether you're an Olympic athlete or um, a, a person going to work every day or going to school. Um, you're only as good as probably the environment in which you, uh, which is supporting you. And one of the things that we're doing at Brightcore is, is looking at buildings and finding ways that they're inefficient and making them more efficient. And that is great for the bottom line. It's great for your ESG goals, your sustainability goals. And I care about that deeply. Um, but it's also great on a personal, professional uh, level. Um, you, the aesthetics are better, the uh, quality of light, the um, envelope in which you're living, uh, the heat and cold, your work environment becomes improved. And so it does straddle an awful lot of what I've always been doing. And, and I love that challenge because it's a big one. I can imagine that there are some similarities between the two career choices. Can you talk to me about being a player on a team with, you know, you played with some of the icons in hockey, and I can imagine you've got a lot of forceful personalities. You know, how, how, what was that like? And does that translate into any of the lessons you've had now being a, you know, president of a company? That's a great question. And I think we in the sports world sometimes can overplay that metaphor. Well, you know, it's about teamwork and it's about, you know, what you learned on the, on the gridiron applies to the, the, the uh, boardroom. And it's just because I stopped a hockey puck doesn't mean I have the ability to do a damn other thing in the world. Um, but it does mean if you had a level of success that you have probably cracked a little bit of the code to um, some degree of, being able to apply yourself, knowing how you function, um, 
having a degree of discipline that is absolutely crucial for any endeavor at a high level. Um, you, you know, you think about, I was just watching a show on Navy SEALs and you have to be strong. You have to have a good eye and be able to shoot guns and everything else. But at some fundamental level, you have to be able to push yourself because anything worth endeavoring, anything that has a big challenge, there's going to be setbacks. And this is where I think that metaphor doesn't get used enough. That level of determination, personal challenge, dealing with difficulty, which is why this conversation even started and having me here today, I think it's really important. Um, and I don't want to get too far on your question, but you do learn a lot about human nature. Um, you know, people say he's a born leader and whatnot. You also learn how to handle people, how to be responsible for yourself first and foremost. But then, then you have to apply that to the people around you. And to the extent that you're doing that um, is going to is the extent that you're going to have success as, as a group. And to the extent that you're not doing that. And I really felt that as a young player. I started becoming good at performing, but I wasn't holding other people to that same standard. Mm -hmm. Why? Maybe you want to be liked. Maybe you don't want the confrontation. Maybe lots of things. But you have to demand that of yourself first and foremost all the time. That's just paramount. But then you have to do it across your, your organization, whether that's a hockey locker room with 20 other people or that boardroom. And I'll just say one more kind of similarity. Whether it's sports or business, <laughs> you're dealing with people. And that's the mm -hmm. fundamental deal. People say business is, you know, it's business. It's not personal. It's absolutely personal. If I've got a manager who's brilliant, but it's poor with people, I don't have a good manager. Um, or I want to keep him where he's strong and I got to manage that those people. You have to figure out how to get the most out of your people. It's always a personal business, no matter what business you're in. I don't care what numbers you're crunching. Ultimately, there's a receiving end to that product and it's going to be a person. So I think that aspect of it, the personal challenge, the discipline that you have to have and the understanding of how to read a room does translate to other walks of life. I, it's so interesting because I think your commentary sort of points to some of my additional questions. So, you know, I know you retired your number 35. I can imagine for some people that feels like somewhat of a loss of identity for players mm. who are now transitioning. And it sounds like you've managed that transition successfully. I guess one of my questions is, you know, is at least as a, as a non-athlete, I would describe myself, you know, I, I, my perception as an outsider is a lot of when you are an athlete, you're getting a lot of external validation in your performance. You're getting, you know, fans. How how do you then apply that? It sounds like you figured out how to then set those metrics for yourself internally. I'm imagining for other people you played with, that process may not have been as smooth. And so how do you kind of now say, okay, I'm going to have to set these, these goals and I'm going to have to be comfortable with an identity that's totally different than the one I've probably lived, breathed, ate, you know, and, and embodied for the past, you know, couple of decades. Yeah. And I'd answer that in two ways. Um, when I was playing with the New York Rangers, uh, you know, now he's my friend, but before he was the GM, Neil Smith, um, had brought on a really tough coach. I remember having a conversation with him and this guy's a very demanding coach. Okay. We had underperformed the year before and it was the right move, but it was going to be personally uncomfortable probably for everybody. And my position was goaltending, so it would happen to fall on me a, an awful lot in this regard. Um, and I think at some point you have to have the, the expectation of yourself that is beyond what other people expect of you. Um, mm -hmm. I better hold myself to a standard that's more than the fans, more than – the GM and more than any tough coach that you're going to bring along. He's going to yell. He's going to scream. He's going to pull you from games. He may embarrass you in the press, but I know when I played well, I know when I didn't. And sometimes you get more credit than is due and you better be damn honest with yourself. Um, the only way you're going to be able to perform to your capabilities to constantly push yourself. Where did I fall short? I might have had a shutout. We might have won three games in a row, but I know I didn't really prepare perfectly or I didn't apply myself well in that game. I have to have that level of demand of myself above and beyond anything around me. And that means not letting yourself off the hook. When you might've had the box checks, you won a few games, you might even be on a winning streak, but you're not playing to your capabilities. That'll come back and bite you. That, that, that's, I think, a, a really um, kind of important aspect. But you talk about the validation. And 
you can't kid yourself too long in sports. It's one of the things we all like about it. It's it's kind of straightforward. If I play poorly, someone scores on me as a goaltender, 20,000 people boo. <laughs> um, <laughs> in New York, and sometimes it's the home team booing. Um, and that is instant gratification or instant feedback in any manner, right? Good and bad. You know what you've done well. You know what you didn't do well. There's plenty of people screaming at you or supporting you. And often it's artificial, but there's an instant feedback mechanism there. I really did find that when I went into the, the working world. Um, life sometimes is a little more opaque than that. Um, and we all love the fact that, you know, you have to stand out there alone on, on the gridiron or whatever it is. But um, you have to figure it out a little bit more. I started in private equity and it was difficult because I, I, I was working hard. Um, I had a great deal of respect and personal discipline, but I wasn't so sure that what I was doing was in the immediate helping the organization, right? It, there was no red light going on behind me. There's no wins and losses in the immediate sense. It could take five months to get a deal, um, you know, under your belt and signed and then start realizing um, what you've done. And so where is that feedback? And uh, just having an approach sometimes without having um, some form of, of kind of important performance metrics is very, very disorienting. It was, it was difficult in the beginning and you have to figure them out for yourself as you go. Absolutely. You know, how have you navigated loss in your life? I know you've had some personal tragedies. I know you also had to make the difficult dis decision after having a second concussion to leave the field of hockey, which is a different type of loss. You know, sure. I'd be curious how how you've approached it and managed your emotions. Well, um, I, I I guess I'm fascinated by that too because one way or another, you're always you're always going to run into that. And I said in the beginning, you know, sport is about sometimes artificial, but you you put yourself out on a limb and sometimes you cut it off and you fall. Um, you're taking risks, right? To do anything worthwhile, you are taking risks. And uh, and life throws those things at you all the time. Look what we've gone through collectively in the last two years, you know, a pandemic, um, you know, now this this geopolitical mess in, in, in Ukraine and it affects everybody and it's stressful. Life, you don't get through it unscathed, you know, everybody, um, has these challenges and it's and it's it's not particularly uh, easy and they can hit you at vulnerable times um you know it's funny because people say well you know it's 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 very difficult because you had an injury and you were forced to retire before you know you really your playing career was over and and that is true i i had some good years left in me and the irony and the frustrating part is you know all these sports whether you're looking at tom brady or anything else your experience matters so much. I may have been stronger at 21, 22, 23 when I was first coming to the Rangers physically, being able to, you know, handle all kinds of physical stress. But emotionally, I didn't have as much experience. I didn't have that bedrock of knowledge of myself and the game and how to react to wins, losses. Sometimes reacting to success is very difficult. So experience makes you a better player. And so by the time I retired at 36, I was a far better player than I was at 26. And um, I could handle the stresses, but my body is starting to break down one way or another. And yes, I had to retire from injuries and that has its own level of, of shock because it's very immediate um, and disappointment. But every athlete is told one way or another, you can't play anymore. Michael Jordan was told in no uncertain terms, you know, Hey, you're great, but you're fading. Wayne Gretzky was the best player in our sport. Amazing player, even when he came to New York. Amazing to watch him play. But he's not scoring 90 goals anymore. He's not scoring 60 goals. He's not scoring 40 goals. He's scoring 20 goals. Still a brilliant player. But he was looking at himself in the mirror and saying, I used to be this, and now I'm this. I can't do this anymore. And, you know, the body tells you. So I think you have to, it, as you said about the member going up to the rafters, it is a – it felt like a death. Um, I, I when someone said your number is going to be retired, I almost I wasn't even I wasn't as excited by that um, incredible um, honor as I was disappointed in the loss of who I was and, and what I used to do. And 
part of it's just ego, but a lot of it is also, man, you've built yourself into this thing <laughs> that responds well to this challenge and you know it and you're getting better every day and your body is getting a little worse every day. Injuries are more often and they last longer. Uh, and at some point you just can't compete with the younger crowd. And, you know, I watch, I'm still a fan. I watch these guys. I think I got it out at the right time. They're bigger, stronger, faster, but you've built this incredible knowledge and uh, um, not only about the game, but about yourself. How do I react? How do I go into this when I haven't played well? Hey, I'm on a winning streak. What do I know is going to take place that I need to avoid? Um, I'm on a losing streak. How do I make it two games, not four games? Um, th th this applies to life, but you have to, you have to get your hands dirty and you have to be in there and you have to be willing to suffer, um, honestly, emotionally at least, um, because it's not pleasant and you are alone. And in the end, you're only answering to yourself, no one else. Yeah. How have you seen other players being able to navigate a sense of identity beyond the sport they're playing in the world and find purpose and meaning? Have you seen characteristics of people who've done it more successfully, less successfully? Yeah, there's always examples of that in, in, in every sport and every walk of life. But getting a level of success in a given area um, makes it in some ways less likely that you're going to start afresh in a new area at the bottom of the ladder and then try to work your way up. Um, and it, there's a lot of fear involved in that. Uh, it's it's What I was just concerned about when I when I end it was making decisions out of strength, not weakness, right? So it's easy to avoid the scary stuff and just slip back into something that you know and is comfortable. And I really found going back to school was helpful. It was a perfect segue. I had left before my undergrad um, degree was finished and and then took a year. I was recovering. My, my injury was a fractured skull and, and you know, you have a brain in injury because of the impact of, of the hit. And um, I just didn't feel well for a while, so I needed some time to heal. But um, then I just applied to schools, and that took a year. I had young kids, so, you know, you're so self-involved as an athlete. You're entirely focused on what you're having for breakfast and what your next, you know, <laughs> game plan is. And then that game happens, you win, that's great. Brush it off, do it again, or you lose. Well, that's bad. Brush it off and do it again. I mean, it is this constant... Um, discipline of almost kidding yourself about this is all that matters this moment and, and you train yourself and need to think in the moment so much and it's it's not an easy thing to do it's an easy thing to do if you're on ice in a car and everything comes to that moment because it's life and death but that's how you almost have to think as an athlete all my energy all my being is focus on this moment. I need to save this shot and I don't need to worry about the next shot or the goal that just went in or the great save I just made every bit of my being has to be here. And when that's over, next moment. And that's how you have to approach it. And it's it's a different mindset and um, it can be very, very valuable. It is crucial. Um, you know, we just watched the Olympics and just watching, you know, skiers go down a hill at 60 miles an hour. They're not thinking about, you know, what they're gonna make for dinner. They're like <laughs> wearing a, basically a Speedo going down a, a rock face at 60 miles an hour. They're focused and that's, a that's a beautiful thing and a necessary piece of your equipment. And if you don't have it, you don't perform. And absolutely, you have to have that in the boardroom. And the weird thing is, too, in some ways, it's harder in the boardroom because you you, you don't get the summer off to regroup. It's a 365, you know, it's, it's every day. Um, and you have people under you. And if you screw up, uh, you know, families are affected. Um, so and there's no retirement until you're really done. Um, <laughs> So uh, I think, um, you know, you have to, there's adjustments to be made, but I think there's definitely processes about myself that I've been able to take a little bit uh, with me. Um, but I think the the thing I want to emphasize is that is scary. You see some people do it well, you see some people do it poorly, but I think you have to be able, a crucial thing is to apprentice yourself. I, I didn't walk out mm -hmm. of the NHL and decide, well, now I know exactly what's going on in the private equity world. Who needs to ask me a question? Um, I better <laughs> zip my mouth and open up my ears, as they say, right, um, and learn a little bit and understand that there are people that are half my age that know more than me. And mm -hmm. you know, if you apply yourself, you'll catch up. But if you don't, you're going to be lost. And you have to be willing to take that, in a way, a step backwards, at least in your ego, and just go, whoa, you know, lots to learn here.
Well, it's remarkable, your sense of humility, because I would say for many people who haven't gotten nearly to the depths and to the heights of their careers that you have, you know, they come in at an older age into a new career path, and they do struggle with sort of balancing their own experience, which may not be germane to a certain field, but how do you kind of balance that with somebody who's younger and is trying to give you yeah. advice? Um, I also think it's really interesting to listen to your points about hockey and and how you have to be in the moment. It sounds like a very sort of intense form of mindfulness, which is really where we're trying. I, I feel like the movement now has been less, uh, it's been moving away from multitasking and proving that you can do five things at the same time and very much towards how do you just stay right in the moment? Yeah, and that, that's interesting. I've got three young boys and you know they, they don't know a world without uh, handheld devices and, and Facebook and you know, Twitter and everything else that's instantaneous. And everything around us, it seems at this moment, is is asking us, forcing us, needing us to be scattered all over the place. I I, I ride bikes a lot and I always look through the windshield and people are you know, <laughs> watching the evening news as they drive over me and uh, their car. And um, we, we are scattered. It's, it's, it's just part of where we are. You know, I've got in my office two or three monitors and there's lots coming in and it just, it, it's it's where we are, and I think it does put a premium on that mindfulness, and and I I find that that's a it's a really good practice, and I miss that uh, because it was almost meditative, really, when you when you mm -hmm. enter into the into the crease where where a goaltender sits in in an ice hockey rink. I can remember the first year I went into the playoffs in New York, and it was different because I tried to be as good as I could every game, as everybody does. But once the playoffs came, it was it was now kind of put your big boy pants on. This is real. The fans have expectations. It's New York. Maybe you had a good season, but your, your, your career is made in the playoffs. And I can just remember stepping out in the ice into first or second round and just saying, there's nowhere else in the world I'd rather be. You know, all the yelling, all the screaming just kind of went away. And you're just in your own little world. And you know how to function there. As soon as you get out of it, it's hell. <laughs> you better not <laughs> Read the paper for good or bad or anything else. Don't get caught up in how many wins you have, losses. What am I doing right now to be my best? And it's a beautiful place when you hit that, you know, and it's a really disconcerting thing when you lose it. And, you you know, you go in and out of it. You just saw Michaela Schifrin, for instance, the downhill skier in the Olympics. And she's hopefully, I think this weekend, going to get back on track to win the, the World Cup. But even the best in the world, they, they have to fight to get this and fight to keep it. And they lose it sometimes. So... You know, humans aren't perfect, and and we 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 love to have these expectations, even of great players and and great performers uh, from you know the corporate world, uh, from Google down to you know Tesla. We have these things that they're infallible. Now these guys have to get up in the morning and keep that discipline too, and and keep that edge. And and those who can keep reinventing that that need for perfection are the ones that are successful long term. Absolutely. You've mentioned your boys a couple of times during the segment. Was it a big decision for you uh, to have them play hockey, given all that you've experienced? Man, you know, it's, that's a great question. Wayne Gretzky retired. He, I was fortunate enough to play with him in New York. Um, uh, Neil brought him in, our GM, and uh, it was amazing watching one of the best players in all of sport, how he reacts, how he gets himself prepared, um, wins and losses, all those things. You're looking at a really accomplished uh, human being, you know, a genius, some would say, of his of his endeavor. And uh, he said everything he had in life was was because of hockey. Like when he was retiring, he just said, this, this sport has given me so much. And, and it, I think it caused a lot of us in that room and probably across the hockey world to say, wow, you know, you, we are really fortunate. You are in this bubble which is pretty artificial and mm -hmm. you're you you are focused day to day and it sneaks up on you when your career ends up ending uh one way or another because you're so moment to moment a sudden the tap on the shoulder says it's over and he had this great perspective he always seemed to be a little ahead of the game either on the ice or even just how his approach was and i feel the same way um for sure i think most guys should say that i mean yeah it, it, it's such a wonderful life if if, if it works out for you there are downsides, right? It's dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's, you know, the career is not easy to do. And, you know, when you look at your kids, your instinct as a parent uh, is to just keep them from harm. Everything about it is I want to support them. I want to have that boy or girl 
live the best life possible, they're perfect when they come out. You know, how do I not get in the way and screw it up? And how do I shield them from all the bad things that are out there? <laughs> but that in itself is a problem because they're going to skin their knee and they're going to have disappointments and they're going to get rejected, and, you know, personally and professionally. And they have to grow that muscle and learn to deal with it. What you don't want is this ton of bricks to land on them all at once when they've never had that experience. They've never had the, 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 you know, one or two steps in the ladder and all of a sudden they're falling from the top. And um, so back to your question, um, I love what sport in general can teach. Um, I don't want to overplay it because, you know, there's I have great friends and great experience with people who have never stepped foot in a sport arena and they're very resilient and very tough and, and very accomplished. But it does, it is a really cool playground to learn about the self um, in its own way. Um, but also I just think there's so much fun and health involved. So absolutely, I want my sons to experience what I did uh, in, in every direction. Really hard balancing act between it worked for me, it may not work for you, this is your life. So you might like baseball or you might not like sports at all. So pursue what you want to pursue and do it with as much you know integrity and discipline as possible. But um, the downsides are there too. And you know we've had this rash of contact sports and some non-contact sports um, with, with head injuries. And, you know, the irony is that I retired from it. So, you know, I see my son out there getting slaughtered. I'm thinking, Oof, you know, that's not something I want. I've coached plenty at the youth level and you better err to caution there. You know, if someone gets hit or has some kind of, you know, head injury, um, stick him out a few games. He's, his, his family's not getting food on the table. Let's, let's make this as safe as possible. But those risks are there, and and I got to tell you, it's a roller coaster to have kids playing at any level. Um, my oldest boy is now um, playing in college, and he doesn't dress every game, but he's a hell of a player. And there's a big world out there with a lot of competition, more than when I was a kid. So you do what you always do, and you just put your nose to the grindstone and figure it out. And uh, you know, I, I help him as much as I can, but I don't have all the answers other than just apply yourself and and, and find the soft spots, and and you know make sure you come with your best effort because you're not probably going to have too much success if you don't have that. So um, to answer your question, I, I do have them play. And my oldest boy, my youngest boy, both play. My middle guy is just like, what a silly thing, chasing a puck around. I'm like, I can't disagree with you, Jim. <laughs> There's a level of silliness to it. So um, you, you, do, you do try to have them um, pursue their own life because you can't live it for them. Well, I would say if your career in clean energy goes away, you could definitely be a parent coach. You've got a lot of insight and humility and, um, and just a, a refreshingly honest perspective about how you view these decisions. So my last question to end the podcast is just what are your hopes for you and for your family over the next couple of decades? Whew, gosh, you know, if you had asked me that two years ago, I would have a, a series of pretty narrow answers. I probably still do, but I think we've all just experienced you know, just the uncertainty that life does bring. And and it's rare to have that visited upon you personally and share it with your entire neighborhood, state, world. Um, I've got great neighbors here. I live in Connecticut. And, you know, just the kind of shock that they were having as as people passed away from, from the pandemic and the fear of the unknown when it first came out. Is this something that's a cold or are we really in, you know, looking at a, uh, you know, black plague or what is this? Um, and and I think people are just a little more raw and vulnerable right now. And I just think it, it it's, I think we're as a society somewhat um, stressed. And and just you think about God how carefree it can be. Life can be so easy on those <laughs> on those moments between these either tragedies or just um, challenges and savor them because you're never, mm -hmm. you're never not going to have them in business, in, in personal life, uh, no matter what your pursuit, they're there. Um, and it's, it's part of the deal that we, um, we make when we're born. Um, you're going to end up dying and you're going to have suffering between that time you're born and the time you die, but there's going to be absolute bliss and great things worth fighting for along the way and do it with integrity and enjoy as much as you can while you can, because Damn, you know, it, 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 you ask people in Ukraine right now. It, 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 this, mm -hmm. you, you see these stories. I was there's a woman quoted. She's like, I was going to plant my tulip garden on Sunday. I'm learning how to shoot a, a an AK-47 now. You know, it's like mm -hmm. that's a 
that's life, you know, and, and it's an unfortunate extreme example of it, but uh, there's, there's not too much that's, that's certain other than, you know, you're going to have to be able to react and, and handle um, the wrinkles that are inevitably thrown at you. And sports is a good metaphor for it, but um, I think, you know, the real stuff is, is sometimes can be a lot harder, both in work and, and, and personally. So be prepared for it. Well, thank you. What a great, note to end on. It's an important message. And thank you, Mike, so much for coming on to our podcast today. I really enjoyed the conversation and found it very engaging on a range of topics. So thank you. Yeah, Arden, thanks so much for having me. Great stuff. And I appreciate you having me. Thank you. And thank you to all our listeners and viewers. If you're so inclined, please go on your podcast platform of choice and give us a positive review. And we look forward to you listening and tuning into our next episode. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Balance Sheet a podcast designed to help advisors, clinical professionals, and affluent families solve some of their biggest medical, psychiatric, and emotional challenges. Visit beyondthebalancesheet.com to read more about our guests and resources and sign up for our newsletter.